So uh, this session is about using the Windows API to, uh, to do fun and crazy things with your GUIs and other people's GUIs. So I'm Jeremy Marquis. Um, I've been using Labby for over 20 years. Um, along with me here is George. Uh, we both work at G Systems. Um, George has been using Labby since one point something. Um, and so uh, we both have a lot of years of experience and a lot of uh, expertise domains, but in this particular uh, this particular domain, I just want to be clear who it is that has the real expertise between the two of us. <laughs> so I want to stand up here and blow smoke and fire, and uh, George is the guy that's actually doing all the hard work. Okay, so the uh, obligatory uh, company plug. Uh, <laughs> we work for G Systems. It's uh, just a few hours drive north in Dallas. We've been uh, Alliance partners for more than 25 years. Uh, we do lots of uh, from consulting to full turn key systems. Um, and uh, do a, if you see our booth on the expo hall, or you did, um, you'll see we do a lot of uh, aerospace, RF, and energy. All right, so what is this about? So we're, we're going to talk about adding GUI features that's really not possible with just pure G. You can't just do it in native lab view. Um, for example, creating arbitrarily shaped interactive windows or objects, um, or adding visual effects to your uh, front panel objects. Um, and the part I get really excited about is manipulating third-party executables for your own benefit. Um, so how to programmatically operate them, uh, add controls or draw on them, or integrate them into your, pull them into your own LASI windows and make them part of your application. So why should you care? Um, so the point is to extend your capabilities as a, as a LabVIEW developer and to save, um, for the third party executables, to save time where you're not trying to reverse engineer uh, someone else's product to, re to recreate it in your own. Okay, so a little bit of background. George, do you have WinSpy up? Um, so we're not talking about Microsoft Windows. We're talking about uh, when we say the Windows API, we're talking about uh, an API to the Windows class. And most uh, most programs and GUIs are made of lots of different window components. Um, so, actually, George, do you have something up? Yeah. We split this to two uh, to to uh, two different computers. So my plan was he would just show my computer, but Matt is going to do his own. All right, we're going to wing it. All right, so this tiny little thick box that he has is a, a little free utility called WinSpy. It just uh, lets you inspect uh, inspect windows. So George, can you like wave it around the uh, taskbar? Um, okay, so that's a window. Uh, the start, bar, start button is a window. Um, your system tray is a window. The clock is a window. Um, so all so the GUI is made up of a lot of different little Windows uh, components. <laughs> all right. Um, so all these windows, uh, as I said, they're they're class based, right? So they all have some relation to each other: uh, parent, child, sibling. Um, they all have a position in the drawing stack, in the Z stack. Um, and since they're class-based, they all have some kind of hopefully documented operational interface, right? Um, things that uh, when 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 you get to working on third-party executables, um, of course people can create their own Windows classes, but mostly people just reuse what's already there. So um, so there's lots of documentation on MSDN website for. Uh, the, the class interface and uh, function calls and parameters you need to send, and it's uh, so we're not going to cover all of those because there's probably I don't know hundreds, maybe thousands. <laughs> um, and so, but uh, but we're going to show you where to look, and it's pretty easy. It's not like you'd remember it anyway by the time you get home. Um, 
All right, so this is a very demo-focused presentation, and so we're just going to get right into the demos. Okay, so our first one uh, is a radial menu. Uh, especially this year, I started seeing this all over the place. It's even on like the marketing graphics on the registration booth downstairs. Um, and what this is going to demonstrate is irregularly shaped windows um, using topmost windows and, and the right way to move a move a window that does not have a title bar. All right, so here's a lab UV hub. That looks familiar, except it doesn't look particularly lab UV. All right, and this radial menu is built in LabVIEW and then finished with the Windows API. Um, so some things you might notice right away um, is that as he drags it around, there's a, like a giant hole in the middle. You can see through it. You can actually click through it. It's actually a void in that window. Um, he has it uh, as set to topmost, so it will stay floating above all other windows. And because of that, he sets some uh, transparency to it when he's not uh, when, when he's pet is not moused over it, so that you can see through it. Um, and we're kind of going to use this. George, will you grab it and drag it around a little bit? Thanks. Yeah, we're kind of going to use this as our demo launcher for the rest of our demos. Um, is there anything else we want to show about this? Or just start the explanation. I hate to give it away. It's like when a magician gives away the trick. It's like, oh, that's not so cool. All right. <laughs> All right, so do y'all recognize that little thing, right? It's the cursor manipulation buttons for an XY graph. Um, you can actually pull those off and then start stretching them, you start customizing them. Um, so this was our step one for making this radial control. Um, is to stretch out these diamonds. Um, you'll see this get constructed. Now, the reason why, why are we grabbing something rather than just like using a, a decal that's shaped like a diamond? The, the reason why is anything that's already in, uh, already in LabVIEW already has the click region that matches the graphical region, right? If you make this a button, a round or rectangular uh, button, and stuck this diamond decal on it, then anything in this box would, would activate that that diamond rather than being uh, rather than matching the graphical shape. So you get to save a lot of work by not trying to mask out regions by uh, just using what you can out of what's already in that. So this is the exciting second step. Uh, just create four big buttons, right? <coughs> and now you're starting to see it come together. You overlay your diamonds on your four big buttons. <coughs> Put them in a cluster so the frame cuts off the ends, right? So I told you, you're going to think like, oh, that's not so cool, right? Um, <laughs> but the point is, like, get as far as you can with just your core lab view skills, and a little bit of Windows API will take, will take you the rest of the way. And then that's not LabVIEW, right? So now it's time to use our Windows API function. So what we did is there's uh, there's only a few like uh, critical function calls. One is this uh, to create a, a circular region, right? We did this and we created two regions, one inner one, one outer one. Uh, and then we did a combine with uh, basically subtracting the two regions from each other. So now we have a region that's just this ring, right? And then you apply that window region to the window. So, uh, so like this is the window handle. Um, this is the region that we created here, and, uh, and then whether or not to redraw it. But uh, so now we have a, a window that's literally just this ring, right? The inside, our inside that ring is not part of the window. Outside of the ring is not part of the window. All right, so getting back to uh, starting with LabVIEW components, uh, it saves you a lot of work. Unfortunately, this is like basically all of them, even from DSC. 
Um, so there's not that many shapes. You can get creative, um, like George does, and uh, and try to composite them to get, get the shape objects that you need. Okay, so you notice he clicked on the ring. There was kind of a little inner inner ring on that on that ring that he could mouse down on and drag that uh, drag that window around. Um, and uh, so the, the the correct way to do this is to uh, treat treat the program like Windows treats it. When you do a mouse down op uh, operation, you're going to send a message to Windows that's a, and redirect where the mouse down happened. So um, one thing that we that you will see a lot for for trying to like drag Windows around is uh, there's an event structure. Um, and after a mouse down event, it does one of two things. It either starts processing all the mouse move events, um, which is pretty OK. But if they move the mouse too fast, uh, then it can go off the LabVIEW window before, and, uh, before it finishes processing the backlog of mouse move events. And then it no longer receives any mouse move events. And you lost your window when you tried to drag it around. Um, the other solution that I've seen is uh, just in the timeout case, just pull the cursor position like as fast as you can, which like we all, none of us want to do that, right? Um, and uh, it's a terrible waste of resources. Um, and uh, and it, it ends up looking kind of sluggish. And it's not a consistent behavior from system to system. It depends on the power of the system to your point. All right. Um, and in either case, they just manually you know, move the, uh, the window position to match either the mouse move or the cursor position. OK, so instead, all, you, all you're doing is out on that, you still have an event structure. On your mouse down event, you're going to message your own window that where the click happened is actually in the title bar, um, which is, is not there. You can't see it. Um, and you're going to see this, this function over and over, post message. Um, there's lots of different post. There's lots of different message formats to the post message depending on the window class that you're sending to. In our case, uh, in our case, we have this non-client, uh, non-client window button uh, button down. So that's we push the button down on part of the non-client uh, par uh, part of the window. That means the frame, right? And then uh, we clarify that it's in the title bar with this one. And uh, throughout this presentation, I'm going uh, to show the calls in this like C kind of uh, format, just because this takes up so much space once we start getting, you know, getting farther along. But it, it's just as simple. It looks just as simple as this. This is the post message call. We started with the release capture. Uh, this is just something you have to do to uh, to like reset the mouse status. Um, and then we just sent in our own window as the uh, as the recipient of the of the button press. From your experience, how well are you working with the Win APIs? How The question is, how well are the Win APIs documented? Um, very well, because it's a Microsoft maintained website. You go to uh, MSDN. I don't I don't remember the site. I always just Google it and then go to it. It's it's actually on the slides later. Um, George probably has a good mark. Um, uh, so the documentation is easy to find. So um, a lot, a lot of these, I'm just showing you like the, the the most important one, right? The post message. There will be some other little things you have to do to get it to work, but these are the critical ones. And you'll see there's not that many that you have to use to actually get a lot of uh, to get a lot of mileage out of them. Okay. And then the other thing that. Uh, that we saw with that radio menu was uh, that it was floating on top. It always floats on top. In fact, when we had this presentation and the demos on the same laptop during the presentation, the radio menu is like right here, and my coworkers are like, "Why is that still on these slides?" Um, so, uh, topmost windows. So the way the way they're categorized is there's a, a, a category of topmost windows and a category of normal windows. Um, it doesn't mean the active one. It doesn't mean uh, frontmost. There's a frontmost in both categories. 
Uh, so topmost windows are always going to stay on top, even if you have a frontmost normal window. The topmost windows will, will be above them. Um, and that is with this uh, set window position. Um, what we did was it looks like a lot of looks like a lot of calls, but it's not. I think it's really just uh, coordinates. Um, and this is your Windows handle that you're uh, going to be setting. And with this flag, if you set it to negative one, it makes it topmost. Okay. So we got a lot of mileage out of that one demo. We're going to go to the next one. Um, so this is custom control shapes. So this is a controls that you have on your lab view window. Um, it's really hard to make irregularly shaped controls. Um, and uh, you saw how we did the, that radial menu. That was actually a window. This will be a control. But, um, but like we used the cluster to match to like crop off the edges of the window, we're going to use the Windows API to start masking some regions. Actually, uh, two buttons, the yin and the yang. Um, George, can you mouse over one of those? The center dots are just indicators that you're in the other buttons region. And um, yeah, it was, as he follows along this curve, you can see that it's it's defined it aligned. The button clickable region is aligned perfectly with the circular region. You will also see, like, hey, what happened to the lab view menu? It's kind of weird, right? It's, it's missing. Um, and that's that masking that I'm talking about. So we left that like that on purpose just, uh, just to make it clear. All right, so this one is. Uh, even, even a simpler <coughs> magic trick. Um, we have two buttons, lab view buttons. They come in round and uh, rectangular. Um, so we pick one, of, one, we pick one of each and overlay the black on the white. And hey, we grab two more round buttons. <laughs> Put a white one here and a black one here. And uh, two more round buttons. These are in, actually these are our indicators. So these are. Two, two LEDs to, for the eyes of the yin and yang. And now it's looking pretty close, but you have this, uh, this rectangular region. Um, and we had to have this rectangular region because, uh, because we want, because uh, <coughs> there's no way to overlay two circular buttons and still have, um, and still have the clickable region. Um, so then we create this masking region. And that's what you saw on the uh, covering up the menu. Uh, so what we use, we just use a .NET picture box um, and set it to the same color as our uh, as our front panel background. And then just like the radial menu, we created two circular regions, subtracted one from the other, and uh, to make that hole that the that the yin yang sits in. And uh, and and now we have these very abnormal uh, lab view buttons. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of Windows graphical effects that are not. Oh, I'm sorry, we have a question. Go right in. Sorry, on your on the previous example there, are you using the Windows API to capture the now what six buttons that you've got on the screen? No, the, the only thing we use the Windows API for was to control this picture box. Okay. So those buttons are still in in LabVIEW, okay. uh, and actually, the like the white region is actually two buttons, right? Where there was the big. The, the big chunk and then the, then the then the round button and in the background in the code you push either of them they both tie together. Yeah. Yes, sir. No, not for performance, um, especially with. Uh, 
with LabVIEW. I'm, I'll explain a little bit later. Uh, I'll, or I can explain it now. Uh, most programs they have all these Windows components, all these window like window objects on their on their GUIs, um, and each one of those has their own redraw. But LabVIEW treats the whole screen as one component and just redraws the whole screen. So uh, having things. Uh, overlaps, well, yes, it does make VI Analyzer complain at you, and y'all should all be using it, um, that uh, it won't cause a performance issue. Any other questions? All right, so uh, Windows have some visual effects that LabVIEW doesn't actually support, um, and I'll let George show you one. <coughs> All right, so let's say you have a, <laughs> yes, you, we can do our whole GUIs like this and it'll be like a high school PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> um, so, you know, you've seen people do this with Windows and you can do it with the entire window, but it's not very often that you see things like that on your lab, with a LabVIEW object, right? And that's because uh, we faked it. Um, <laughs> So we left this little white box here so you can see. Uh, this is a LabVIEW graph uh, with real data on it, and this is a picture box. So uh, go ahead and switch to the, back to the slides. I want to make sure I don't miss a, miss a step. All right, so we used the .NET picture box. We, we took an image of the graph, stuck it in the picture box, Resize the picture box to the same size as the graph, and uh, hid the graph, and then called this uh, animate window function on the .NET picture box. Because the .NET picture box is a window that, that, uh, that we can operate on. So we faked it, but it looks good. So that's really static editor, it's not. Yes, by the time the animation starts, it's a static picture rather than your, rather than your graph. That's correct. So, you know, you can do this with things like uh, configuration pan panes or things that you want to appear that, you, that, that the user can like pull into the pull into view and operate on and then send out a view. Um, it's, a, it's a nice touch. It makes it feel a lot more modern. Um, everybody expects their GUIs to behave like on your phone, right? Um, in fact, a couple of years ago, I found some old GPS and I'm like pushing all over the screen and it's not doing anything and I realized, well, this Hasn't been that long, right? And this is not a touch screen. Like, how did you? <laughs> so our expectations are always, always accelerating. And that's the challenge for us as engineer the lab developers. All right, so this is the part where, uh, when I learned about this, I was like, man, I could have used this so many times. Uh, manipulating third party executable. All right, so we're going to start with a demo with uh, uh, NIDMM. So y'all, it's a little the DMM software uh, software panel. Go ahead, George. Oh, I'm sorry, not that one. It's uh, that's next. That's coming soon. Uh, this is uh, we're going to use the Windows calculator. All right, so there's the normal Windows calculator. There's a VI that George made just to make have a, an easy way to operate on this calculator. And he can push buttons on, uh, from LabVIEW and have those button presses posted to, uh, posted to that calculator. Uh, and as you would imagine, you can run a, a you can script a sequence of, of operations. Uh, all right, that's leaked. All right. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so you can take somebody's third-party executable and uh, and operate it from your program and not have to depend on an operator remembering to go over and push buttons or configure things correctly. All right, so we come back and it, again it's this post message call. Um, but of course it's, a, it's a dip, a definitely a different set of parameters. Um, so 
what we're doing is we're posting a message to the target window, which is the third party EXE, that, uh, that one of its buttons was clicked. Um, and in the, I'm not sure about Windows 10 calculator, but the Windows 7 calculator, every button is its own window. So it makes it really easy to, to say, you know, that, that window was clicked. Um, so this is the same function we use to click on the title bar. Um, and what you will see sometimes, you'll see people, or a, a solution people try, is they will actually move the mouse cursor to the button and click it and then move it back to the regular application. Right? Um, not particularly reliable um, and uh, it's disruptive to the, to the user. Right? Um, and then the other big advantage of this is you're just sending a message to their, their EXE that their button was pressed. Their EXE doesn't have to be uh, like front most, active, anything. It can be minimized, it can be hidden, and you can be operating their EXE in the background and, uh, and your, your end user doesn't ever have to even see it. Yes? That's correct. So this is not a geographical coordinate. This is uh, when you first, uh, when you, you test this out before you do it, all right, you have a, you pick an EXE you want to operate on, and you use a tool like WinSpy to get the, uh, to get all the IDs of all the windows. And, uh, and then you're just sending, uh, sending that a button press happened to that window handle. It's not a geographic uh, a coordinate system. Just a minute, Mike, Chris. Yes, you could make like like silent installers with this if you wanted to. Yes, uh, I had not thought of that. Thank you, Chris. All right. What did Chris ask? He uh, can you use this to uh, basically unman uh, uh, installations. So your program could download other things and install it, press, you know, navigate through the install wizard, um, and and you knew it got done. Mike? Have you, have you tried running this on a LabVIEW built executable? On a LabVIEW built executable? Uh, so build, you, you can... You can build executable. Yeah. Yes. Um, and... That, that's great. We'll go. That's a good segue for our next uh, next demo. The Windows handle is always the same. Okay, so uh, so each Windows object, and you can find this pretty high up in the documentation. Each Windows object, so like on the calculator, each button is a window. Um, it has a ID that is static for that exe. Um, then you have to look up the reference to that ID um, when you when you uh, are to be able to find the handle. So that handle is actually a reference. The reference changes from launch to launch, but the ID never does. So you just enumerate through the IDs and grab their their handles. Good question. If you have multiple calculators open, um, a lot of this depends on how well they constructed their EXE, right? Um, if they're using a bunch of objects that are all the same class and they didn't name any of them, um, it's going to be a, more of a challenge to figure out which one is which. One is which. If you launch executable and you know the end of the Oh, that's a good point. George says, yeah. Yeah, George says, if you launch that executable, then you know which executable to grab the handles from. All right, so this next one, um, the, now we're gonna use the uh, NID in them. So it's an EXE built in my view. And oh, I'm still getting the, the demos wrong. Uh, this is a, some random, like I just found something on the internet that was a free utility for us to do this on. Um, <laughs> go ahead, George. <coughs> I'm actually fascinated to see what this is gonna, what this is gonna do. So this is a Wi-Fi scanner, right? So you, we're in the convention center. Who knows, right? It might all be just white. Um, 
So, uh, so we have this utility. George is going through their their tab selections um, on the frequency scanner. Um, he can operate their drop down. So watch. So you saw him do it over here. Do that again, George. And then he he applies it up there. None of this is coordinate based. All of it is based on objects and their handles. That is correct. So we have a handle to that, to this window, to this tab, right? And then we get a, a, a handle to the window that is the drop down. And then we can ask it, what are your drop down elements? Like, what things do you have in there? And then we can, uh, and then we can uh, select one of those. Website. So uh, come and check there, gsystems.com. It's really easy to remember. Will you include it in your monthly newsletter that goes out? Probably, yes. Um, all right, so what did we just show here? Um, basically, again, we're using the post message function, right? But it's a different class. Um, each window has their own, uh, each window class has their own message types. I just pulled this off the MSDN website. It like goes on a lot farther. Um, <laughs> And so uh, what we just used was a uh, combo box. I don't remember which one. Uh, one of those two combo boxes. Uh, there was a tab. Maybe it's this header control. Ah, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you have this whole library of stuff you can use. And again, none of it's coordinate based. You're not manipulating where a mouse cursor is. You're not having to keep track of where everything is on the screen. Again, this could be minimized or hidden, and uh, and this will still work. So one of the ways that we've done uh, view line manipulation in the past is to use something called Sakuni, which is coordinate based, and it fails on virtual machines often. Have you run into any problems with virtual machines in this technology? I don't think I've ever tried this on virtual machines, but I can't imagine that it would be any different. Okay, so the point of that demo was, hey, you get a lot of mileage out of this post message function and you can do a lot of cool stuff. Okay, so now the NIDMM demo that I apparently just can't wait for. All right, so before you do anything else, this is the normal an IDMM soft panel, right? Is that, I, don't, I don't know if anybody's ever looked at this, or if you're all so sophisticated that you don't need to. <laughs> all right. And look what we've done. Uh, we're, it, it looks like it's embedded in our application. Uh, we've added a text box. Um, uh, we've added a text box and like onto their EXE and like put our own stuff in it. Um, we're pulling the value from the DMM uh, into our application. Uh, so there's like full two-way communication here. Um, you can really mess with people's stuff. Um, all right, so George just updated the text box. Um, so uh, this is just like the start. You can go really deep with this. Um, we want to keep the demo simple so they're really accessible. Um, but, uh, you know, we could like put a, a key site logo over that. Um, <laughs> That's correct. If you have, <laughs> you have a handle, as long as it's in a window that you can read from, right? So, so this box is a window. I can grab its value just because I'm on the same operating system. Yes, doesn't that sound secure? Yeah. <laughs> that's a polling, right? It's not even registered to that. That's correct. It is polling. Yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, but do the NIMD and MT may call me later. All right. <laughs> can, you, can you move your, uh, your DMM? Well, we took away the window frame, so right now, no, but um, we just told it where to sit. Um, it's not, in this case, we didn't actually dock it into our application. Um, we can, and we're going to show you that later. But it is a separate window, so if he grabbed, mm -hmm. if, if he had grabbed the uh, main window frame and pulled it around, the DMM would have just sat there. Okay, so that looks really long. It's actually not a big deal. Um, so what did we do? We added a text box to their EXE and wrote to it, right? So we did this create window. So we created a window on their window, and uh, and we made it a text box. Uh, that was the type of window. This is all just like how big coordinates, things like that. Um, and uh, and then we assign it a parent, right? Because this is a child window that we're uh, that we are uh, making it a parent of. So uh, we created a child window on their parent window. And uh, and then we did a send message um, with our text. This this is actually pretty simple. Um, so this is what I was talking about earlier. LabVIEW built EXEs do not have component windows. Um, exceptions are .NET and ActiveX containers. Okay. Um, he's letting me know executions with built in Java are the same. All right, so now we're going to talk about integrating a third-party EXE into your LabVIEW window. All right, so here's our calculator function. Is that now embedded? Yes, that is embedded into our window. It's an EXE. We took away the frame so the, the user wouldn't like try to keep pushing the exit button. And, and it's now in our window. Uh, we can operate on it directly, um, or of course you can still do it programmatically. Um, so, um, so he's, uh, thank you. He was asking, is there clipping with like menus and toolbars and things like that? Um, so, uh, George, Correct me if I'm wrong. I think you defined the uh, the visible region as part of when you when you pulled it into your into this, right? Oh, so if you remove the the frame, does it remove the menu also? Okay. Pointing out a good point, uh, if you have a lot of uh, custom objects uh, along your toolbar menu and you scroll on the LabVIEW window, um, then it can start to obscure the uh, the, top, the menu bar. <laughs> Alright, that's, that's fair. <laughs> uh, I don't. I guess I've never made a GUI that I would scroll. Um, all right, so basically what did we do? We just like hijacked their EXE, right? We put it in our own, uh, we, we like kidnapped their kid, right? Um, <laughs> we said, I know that kid, I'm his parent, literally, right? Uh, we just said, I'm the new parent to that, to that child window, and, uh, and we took it. <laughs> all right, so, um, I will say, uh, test this thoroughly. It is crashy, right? Most of the time, the crashes are because uh, because you're not handling like the setup and cleanup very well. The more complex the EXE is that you're stealing, I mean, using, um, <laughs> uh, the, the, the more testing you're gonna need to do. Um, 
for example, just that little calculator, right? We, we did the step parent to our lab view front panel. Um, we have to make sure to remove that child before we close either of them or lab view will crash, right? <laughs> Uh, so it's simple, but catastrophic if you get it wrong. So test it well. Yes, Chris. So I love stealing other people's work. I don't want anybody to steal mine. <laughs> so is there a way I can prevent somebody from embedding my executable into their Is there a way? George says no. <laughs> I can <laughs> take it, Chris. You could actually pull the parent of your own window, and if it's not a window, then you expect them to serve. So you can actually pull the your parent window, and if it's something else, then Windows. Or oh, you can react. Yeah. 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 So that's a good point. So you can like proactively like do countermeasures here and um, pull pull yourself to see who your parent window is, and if it's not you, you're like, oh, I've been stolen, and then like fail. <laughs> So to his point, they could have taken an NIS executable and embedded key for your report. Well, that's not cool. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, yes, this does bring up some concerns. Um, I'm assuming all of y'all are very responsible and you're going to use this for that really complicated like neutron probe utility or something that you really don't want to like put a serial port sniffer and figure out how their utility works and recreate it all just so you can make a driver for it. <laughs> all right, so there's a bunch more you can do, right? We saw scripting the operation of third party EXEs, uh, masking objects, so like the uh, if we want to use that Wi-Fi scanner in and pull it into our application, we probably want to like cover up the exit button so they can't accidentally press it. Um, reading values from a third-party EXE, we saw that um, you can force windows to be hidden or shown, uh, control where they're positioned. You can disable individual windows objects. Um, <laughs> earlier, George was playing and he was like taking numbers off the calculator, so you can no, no longer use the number six. Um, <laughs> You can also enable them, so if, if you haven't paid for your license, often the controls are disabled, right, so you no can mic. simply enable them. No mic for that guy. All right. <laughs> He's dangerous. All right. <laughs> Do you need a consultant? All right. um, and then uh, you can also create new windows and populate them on the fly. This is not something we really think about a lot with LabVIEW. Um, it's done in lots of other programming languages. But so what do we do? We create a sub, we create a VI and just like leave it on disk. And if we want to use it, we load it and show it, right? Um, and, but you can actually like cr create windows dynamically. Like here's a new window. I'm going to stick three buttons and a text box and and whatever else you know that you want to put in it. And it's an actually fully functioning window that you created dynamically on the fly in your program. Or you can like amuse yourself, right? <laughs> <laughs> Use what you've learned today to make a giant hole in somebody's UI and, s and send a screenshot to tech support. But you have an example of that. <laughs> All right. So how do we apply apply this cool stuff that we've learned? Um, so there it is, msdn.microsoft.com. Um, so that website has, and I just, this is just this is at the top level, um, has many pages deep that you can go, but it's very well organized. It's pretty easy to find stuff. Um, and then again, so conclusion. This was fun, but what was it for, right? Um, so extending your capabilities uh, beyond your standard LabVIEW options. Um, and you notice most of these things, it was LabVIEW, 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 and then the last, you know, the last hand wave was the Windows API. Um, and I like it that way, because it makes it easy for all of your team to maintain and nobody has to go to MSDN and look up what weird thing that you do. Um, and then uh, leveraging third-party third utilities rather than like reverse engineering and rebuilding them. Um, it saves time, it's lower risk, because hopefully they tested their utility very well, um, and, uh, and you can get a lot of mileage out of it. There's, there's a very valid use case for stuff like this, and that is if you your customer has an application to measure a device, and the 
cannot be controlled remotely and they want to automate the task. You can make electric program that interfaces with that application and automates the task. That's, that's an excellent use case. So what he said was, let's say you have a customer who has a semi-automated you know, test, uh, test application where, where you have an operator that you know, pushes buttons and, and does things. You can actually take what they've already done and automate it by pulling it in, by wrapping it in your lab program. Yes, Chris. Sounds like this could be used for auto UI test suites. All right, Chris is like the visionary guy. Right. All right. Um, Startup. He's talking about you can use this to auto to have automatic testing of your GUIs. Right? GUIs are hard to test. Right? You can unit test your functions all day long, but uh, you just like get a kindergartner with a mouse and have them click all over the place. <laughs> or you could do this. Yes. But didn't you say that it's the window? Ah, excellent point. So LabVIEW is one main window. So you do LabVIEW slightly differently. Um, you you kind of combine the Windows API with VI Server. So VI so you can still have access. You you're, if you're testing LabVIEW with LabVIEW, then you can use VI Server. The, that uh, NIDMM that we did, um, it was part Windows API, part VI Server. Let's go and use this uh, APIs like this, for instance, to click latch buttons. Yes, if you want to go just full straight Windows API, then you have to fall back to coordinates if you're testing LabVIEW EXEs. Yes, sir. Um, so do you find for integrating third-party EXE, this solution is better than maybe trying to pull it in with like ActiveX? Um, so that's that's a good question. So well, the question was, is do we find this easier than trying to pull a third party uh, a third party EXE in uh, with something like ActiveX? Um, obviously, we feel like we have a lot more control here. Um, and uh, depending on the EXE, sometimes it doesn't always turn out so well using ActiveX. So it's not a uh, it, it's it's not always a consistent port. I can use that term. Right, and the ActiveX support may not be available. Or partial function, not full function. There's a G tester. All right, if anybody, you know, if you guys know Matthias uh, Budova, uh, is that how you say? Budo, thank you. Um, obviously, I'm Texan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, he is coming out with a G uh, G tester tool that, uh, that, and he's made a lot of cool tools on the Tools Network. If you ever want to go check them out. But the, the G tester is not me. Oh. What's that? The oh, G there he is. Yeah, but the G tester is not me. I don't know that product. Okay, he says that's not him. No. No, so it must not be as good. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of it, not uh, changing parents, but uh, <coughs> there are uh, a window for controls and sending events. Mm -hmm. That's also in botnet. It's a lot easier than the Windows API. I think it's detection. Send it, but I'm not sure I have to check. Oh, yeah, it's just a, just a map. Yeah, but it's a lot easier to use. All right, so his excellent point is there is a .NET wrapper around a lot of this Windows API stuff that might be more accessible um, than the C code stuff that I've shown. Um, but uh, it is under the hood, it's calling the same functions. Um, and uh, <coughs> I don't think any of these, I think all of these are in the past. Yep. So uh, you can visit our booth next year. <laughs> All right, and uh, and do take the survey. Um, I uh, I think all our presenters appreciate getting the feedback because a lot of us will uh, take that and represent at uh, CLA Summit or something like that. So thank you guys very much. <laughs>